Once again, good morning. Good morning. Warm welcome to St. Paul's. Our service of worship and thanksgiving will continue on page 355 of the Book of Common Prayer, page 355. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us give glory to God, singing the hymn on page 356, page 356. be with you. Let us pray. We'll pray the collect, which may be found on your insert. We'll pray the contemporary translation. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior Jesus Christ and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. A reading from the book of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's read the psalm in unison found on the next page of the insert, Psalm 62, beginning and ending with the refrain, for God alone my soul in silence waits, God alone my soul in silence waits, truly my hope is in him, he alone is my rock and my salvation, 
my stronghold, so that I shall not be shaken. In God is my safety and my honor. God is my strong rock and my refuge. Put your trust in him always, O people. Pour out your hearts before him, for God is our refuge. Those of high degree are but a fleeting breath. Even those of low estate cannot be trusted. On the scales, they are lighter than a breath, all of them together. They trust in extortion. In robbery, take no pride. The wealth increase, set not your heart upon it. God has spoken once, twice have I heard it. That power belongs to God. Steadfast love is yours, O Lord, for you repay everyone according to his deeds. For God alone my soul in silence waits. A reading from the first letter to the Corinthians. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. The word of the Lord. Please rise for our sequence hymn, hymn 661. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat, 
with the hired men and followed him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I'm not really one for New Year's resolutions. Maybe you're with me on that. Sometimes they seem a little superficial and ego-driven and often kind of peter out by the end of January. But it seems appropriate that today, early in the year, we're hearing Jesus' first words as he begins his public ministry. And anyone recall what the first words are? The time has been fulfilled. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe in the good news. So I was thinking the other day, if I had to translate that into a contemporary idiom, what would it be? And so I found myself writing a little poem, actually, or it turned out to be a little poem, and it went something like this. The time is now, God is here, change yourself and trust in love, not fear. That was my little poem, I was like, wow, it actually rhymed. <laughs> So anyway, um, think about that. Think about you know, what that might mean for a sort of New Year's resolution. Those are Jesus' first words. It's kind of the whole gospel and ministry. It's his proclamation as he starts out. And again, in, in a contemporary idiom, I think it's this. The time is now. God is here. Change yourself and trust in love, not fear. So what would, Tony is giving me a thumbs up. You like that, Tony, good. I appreciate the vote of confidence. So what would that mean for us, you know, were we to think about it as a kind of resolution? How might we change ourselves in this upcoming year and trust in love, not fear? Well, I think it's a, a very compelling call and certainly the second part of the gospel that we get is when Jesus goes out and gives those very same words to strangers, and what do they do? They immediately follow him. Yes, I mean, what a model of discipleship. I mean, Betsy, you're also shaking your head as you say that, right? Because it seems a little nuts, right? Like, they're in their boats, and he basically, you know, trots out that little ditty, that little poem that I just said, and they're so captivated by it, and they're like, we want to be part of this movement. Yes, we want to be part of this movement of transformation of our own lives and of the world. And immediately, they follow him. So of course, it's a model of discipleship because they're willing to sacrifice, right? What are they willing to sacrifice? I mean, there are only a few lines there, but they're very telling. Yeah, their whole life, right? Their livelihood, they're fishermen, and they're willing to leave the nets and leave the boats. And what about poor Zebedee, right? The father who's just left in the boat. And in that culture especially, you know, the bonds of family and kinship meant everything. So it was a really dramatic thing to sacrifice that and follow Jesus. Now let's contrast that with the other example of following the call that we get, from the Old Testament lesson, we heard the story of Jonah, or part of it. Anybody know the story of Jonah? You probably remember it from Sunday school, right? So this passage, which comes from the middle of the story, says, I think at the beginning, the second time God called Jonah. Does anyone know what happened the first time God called Jonah? Who knows the story? Maria. Yeah, God said, you know what? I want you to preach that good news, right? The same thing Jesus said, trust in love, not fear. I want you to go to the people of Nineveh, 
you know, this big city that's basically living in fear, preach the good news, and what does Jonah say? Uh-uh, God, you know, I just don't have time. It's really gonna, you know, turn my world upside down. And not only does he say, I'm not interested, I like my life as it is, thank you very much, and I'm gonna stay put, what does Jonah do? He tries to hide. He goes in the exact opposite direction. Nineveh is east. He says, I'm going to Tarshish as far as I can go to the west. And in fact, I have to get in a boat to get there. It's like going to the South Pacific. That's what it would have been like um, at that time. And so he goes in the boat. And then what happens? There's a storm, right? Because God is not going to let go so easily. So there's a storm, and he's finally cast overboard by the crew. But thanks be to God, what happens? The big fish or the whale comes and swallows Jonah, and he's in the belly of the whale for three days, and then eventually is you know, spit out onto dry land. And then we get to where we are now. The call comes again. And if we've ever had any experience of God, we know that God is like that, right? He's pretty relentless, and he kind of circles back, and something that we might ignore in our life, some issue, some relationship, ends up circling around again. And, and if we're attentive, we're like, oh, yes, okay, here we are again, God. Okay, I get the message. So this time, what does Jonah do? Justin. He only walks a third of the way through the city, but he goes, he goes, he answers the call. And you know what? He's actually wildly successful. He's wildly successful. Basically, the people of Nineveh, the people and all of the animals, um, if you read the story in detail, they repent, they put on sackcloth and ashes, and God relents, and God relents. And does anybody know Jonah's response to his wild success? He's totally upset. He's totally angry with God. He's like, wait, God, I was really looking forward to that, to judgment day, and I wanted to sit up on the cliff and watch the hail and brimstone rain down upon Nineveh. So this is, a, this is another example of a way that some significant figure, right, in our biblical witness responded, and so we have a little bit of a compare and contrast. And you know, we shouldn't be too hard on poor Jonah, right? Because I'm sure there are a lot of times in our life when something comes around and God presents himself to us, when there's some opportunity to love in a new way and be transformed and changed, and we say, uh-uh, not really interested. I'm going to go the opposite direction because it will change you and it will turn your life upside down. This is what Richard Rohr, of course, has to say about call. <clears throat> what then does it mean to follow Jesus? History is continually graced with people who somehow learn to act beyond and outside their self-interest and for the good of the world, people who clearly operated by a power larger than their own. Consider Gandhi, Oscar Schindler, Martin Luther King Jr., and many unsung leaders. Their inspiring witness offers us strong evidence that the mind of Christ still inhabits the world. Most of us are fortunate to have crossed paths with many lesser known persons who exhibit the same presence. I can't say how one becomes such a person. All I can presume is that they were all called. But it is not an enviable position, this Christian thing. Following Jesus is a vocation to share the fate of God for the life of the world and to suffer ever so slightly what God suffers eternally. This has little to do with believing the right things about God beyond the fact that God is love itself. Those who respond to the call and agree to carry and love what God loves which is both the good and the bad, and to pay the price for its reconciliation within themselves, these are the followers of Jesus Christ. They are the leaven, the salt, the remnant, the mustard seed that God uses to transform the world. 
The cross, then, is a very dramatic image of what it takes to be usable for God. It does not mean they are going to heaven and others are not. Rather, it means they have entered into heaven much earlier and thus can see things in a transcendent, whole, and healing way now. God is calling everyone and everything, not just a few chosen ones, to God's self. To get everyone and everything there, God first needs models who are willing to be transformed. So call is hard because it means a willingness to be transformed. But at the same time, I think we know in the depths of our being that that is the irresistible draw because it really is a, a, the draw into the life and love of God. So I was thinking um, a little bit about this when I was fortunate to go on a brief New Year's Eve trip to Mexico um, a few weeks ago. And it was wonderful. Mary Fran said, don't tell everybody it was 80 degrees every day and that you were able to go swimming in the Pacific. But it was great. It was over New Year's. There were um, lots of dance parties. And so I spent New Year's sort of dancing next to the Pacific Ocean. And um, you may recall that in Advent and Christmas, I was really thinking a lot about rejection and feeling alone. You know, those feelings were really sort of surfacing for me. And so I went to Mexico and had a great time, but on the last day, or my next to the last day there, I was feeling a little ill. You know, I didn't get all that much sleep, I hadn't eaten, and I met um, some friends for breakfast, and the next thing I knew, I had this wave of nausea come over me, and I felt like I was going to faint <laughs> into my breakfast. And indeed, that's what happened. I, the next thing I knew, I fell face forward, and I fainted into my breakfast, Fortunately, my friends were there, and then they, you know, helped me, um, you know, just to lie down. And but every time I got up, I felt a little nauseous again. And um, but then I felt better, and I happened to receive a text message um, on my phone from uh, someone I had befriended, this wonderful Mexican fellow with whom I had spent a lot of time dancing. And he had asked if you know I wanted to get together that evening, and so I sent a message to him and I said I just fainted um, not doing uh, so well and he came down immediately to the restaurant and then he took me to his home and let me just you know spend the day there to rest and relax and he even made an appointment with a local doctor in the evening just to make sure that everything was okay and he was amazing and so, and in addition, I had met him and we had had kind of a funny conversation because he's a self-proclaimed atheist and so when I said I'm a priest, we had all these great <laughs> conversations. And he said, are you really a priest? He said, well, you do kind of talk like a priest, but anyway. So, um, so not only was he this good Samaritan, but um, finally when I was feeling better, I had a conversation with, with God and I was like, God, okay, you have a really great sense of humor because I went 2,500 miles to Mexico to meet an atheist who basically was a good Samaritan to me, but in that experience, I suddenly felt healed and I felt totally held up and held and loved by a power greater than myself and by a power greater than any person but I knew that God was there with me, taking care of me. And so it was this incredible experience of healing, especially when, as I had shared during Advent and Christmas, how these feelings of rejection and abandonment and being alone had been so strong. So for me, that experience of God taking me to Mexico to meet an atheist who uh, brought me back to my sense of calling was an example of returning to love, trusting in love, not fear. And so that brings me back to that little poem that I wrote, because when I wrote it, I was like, you know, that actually sounds like the famous song from Rent, No Day But Today. Does anyone remember Rent from, you know, a few decades ago? And one of the, you know, sort of most famous songs is No Day But Today. And so I looked it up, and I thought, oh my goodness. This is the great, you know, Broadway singer Edina Menzel basically proclaiming the gospel. And this is what she, she writes, or this is the song. 
There's only us, there's only this. Forget regret, or life is yours to miss. No other path, no other way, no day but today. There's only us, only tonight. We must let go to know what's right. No other road, no other way, no day but today. I can't control my destiny. I trust my soul. My only goal is just to be. There's only now, there's only here. Give in to love or live in fear. No other path, no other way, no day but today. So my prayer for all of us is that our resolution, if we have one, will be Jesus' call. The time is now, God is here. Change yourself and live in love, not fear. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us stand and reaffirm our faith in the words of the Creed, which may be found on page 358 of the Book of Common Prayer, page 358. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, Look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Would someone be willing to lead us in the prayers of the people today? Laura, thank you. Um, let's do Form 3. I think that's 387. Yes. We pray especially today for love and healing for Abigail, for Ron Bellinger, for Bob T, for Bruce, for Charlotte, for Chris, for Cindy, for Dave, for Diane, for Juliana, for Kevin, for Stephen Gilbert, for Jim Johnson, for Margaret, for Karen Trebell, for Blake and family, for Haley, for Rick and Patricia, and for Tim, for any others on our hearts or on our lips at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those struggling with addiction and for their families and friends. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the people of Ukraine and Israel and Gaza and all who suffer in war-torn places. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the life of Pam Goss, a longtime member of Christ Church Bethlehem. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. And we pray for peace and peacemakers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Are there any prayers in the basket today? No? Okay. Let us turn to page 395 and we'll pray the concluding colic at the bottom of the page.
Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, you have made us one with your saints in heaven and on earth. Grant that in our earthly pilgrimage, we may always be supported by this fellowship of love and prayer and know ourselves to be surrounded by their witness to your power and mercy. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whom all our intercessions are acceptable through the Spirit, and who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. And I believe we've had a few birthdays um, this past week and then the week ahead. And so I'm wondering if Ann Combs is here. Yes, she is. And Carol Moore, would you be willing to come down, um, the two of you, so that we could give you a birthday blessing? I think, Ann, your birthday was this past Monday, right? Yes. And Carol's is this coming Friday. And Denise was, Denise's birthday was last Sunday, but she told me she received a birthday blessing last Sunday. And she was good. OK. they are. Okay, come on down. And if everybody um, would turn to page 830 in the Book of Common Prayer, and we'll pray um, the prayer for a birthday, prayer 51, over Anne and Carol. So um, come here and let me, uh, here, we'll do, I'll put a hand on, on one of you, and then, there we go, we'll do it, yes, that's nice, we'll do a little trinity. Okay, all right, is ready everybody? Watch over thy child, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts may thy peace, which passeth understanding, abide all the days of their life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Happy birthday! Yay! Happy birthday! <laughs> Turning now to page 360, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor, kneeling at Babel. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of the Lord be always with you. Also with you. Please greet one another in Christ. Feel free to be seated for any community announcements. Um, let's see, I have two. Well, actually, the first, Kathy, do you want to come forward um, and just tell us about next Sunday? Next Sunday, we'd like to invite everyone to Breakfast Church at Christ Church. And I realize that it's just about a year since we hosted the first one. And so much has happened, and we are so thankful for our relationship with St. Paul's and, and pray that it will continue and grow. Thank you. 
Thank you, Kathy, and thank you so much for hosting us. Um, it allows us at St. Paul's to kind of sit back and relax for a Sunday um, and just enjoy uh, the wonderful breakfast offered by the Parishioners of Christ Church. So thank you so much. So next Sunday, the 28th, will be in the Parish Hall at Christ Church Bethlehem. And then the following Sunday, can you believe it, um, will be February 4th, if I'm not mistaken, and that is the annual meeting. So please come um, to our annual meeting on Sunday the 4th. And I think um, prior to that, actually, is February 2nd, uh, known as Groundhog Day um, in the secular world, but in uh, the church world, it's Candlemas, which is sort of a lesser um, but beautiful feast day. And we're going to have a Candlemas candlelit spaghetti supper. Um, Justin <laughs> has graciously um, decided to give a reprise uh, to our Day of the Dead event, and so we're going to have a spaghetti supper um, on Friday, February 2nd, Groundhog Day slash Candlemas. Um, hopefully we'll receive some donations at the door, so it will be a little bit of a fundraiser as well, but just a wonderful way to, to gather um, during the winter season. Um, so stay tuned for more news about that. Um, any other announcements? Live in love as Christ loves us and gives himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Our offertory hymn is 321, 321.
in the mystery of the Word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.